my adore my 64 my commodore 64 hi there and welcome to a let's type episode from the commodore 64 appreciation society this is a series where i reach back into the past and type out a program from an old computer magazine and then when i finish typing it in i play it i gotta say Doing these videos has been such a blast. It's been so much fun revisiting the magazines I grew up with, and I love hearing from all of you who are enjoying them. Growing up at the dawn of the personal computing era was such an exciting time, and I'm glad I get to share some of those memories and that passion. Clearly, that excitement hasn't faded. It's amazing to see the Commodore 64, Computes Gazette, and other classics from that era making a comeback. So keep those comments, requests, and memories coming. And if you're new here, or if you just want more of this kind of retro goodness, make sure to check out the Type In Programs playlist. There's a link in the description. All right, without further ado, let's get into today's program. The September 1983 issue of Compute was fantastic, and we've already covered several games from it. Caves of Ice, Diamond Drop, and Dots. But there's still one left, and I thought it would be fitting to close out the issue with it. The game is called Mystery Spell, and it looks like a fun one. So let's get typing. Mystery Spell was written by Doug Hapeman for the TI-99 4A with Extended Basic, and versions were also provided for the VIC and Commodore 64. It's basically a cheerful take on the classic game Hangman, but instead of gallows and a hanging stick figure, the Commodore 64 version uses colorful graphics and birds. Hapeman's original TI version is even more joyful. It has balloons, smiling faces, and cheerful music. By looking at the magazine screenshots and reading the notes, it's clear the interface differs quite a bit between the original and the Commodore adaptations. The graphics are different, the layout is different, and the TI version includes sound. I've always found these cross-platform differences fascinating. The way Compute operated back then was pretty simple. The original developer would submit a program for their platform, in this case the TI-99, and Compute's in-house programmers would then recreate it for other systems. But those conversions often ended up very different. The biggest example I've seen so far is Blockhead, which I covered a month or two ago. The 64 version was nothing like the Atari original. It was practically a whole new game. With Mystery Spell, the differences aren't quite that extreme, but interesting nonetheless. The 64 certainly had the horsepower to match the TI version, so why change the interface? Maybe they tried to keep the Commodore versions close to one another in order to keep coding easier. Or maybe they just had programmers who were good at certain things and not others? Or maybe, actually probably, the reasons were just practical. Limited time and limited resources, just like everywhere else. Still, it would have been fun to have been a fly on the wall during some of those discussions. Nowadays, it's almost unthinkable for a game to look or play significantly different between platforms. But back then, that was just how it was. I'm currently working through a section of code that's responsible for drawing the house and trees from the screenshot. These parts are usually pretty straightforward, but they're packed with special characters, colors, and spaces, which makes it really easy to slip up. It's especially tricky on an emulator because I don't have the visual cues that you get from the 64 keyboard, those little graphics printed right on the keys. Sometimes I have to switch between positional and symbolic layouts just to get the right character. Sections like this take forever to type, and I'm always worried the result is going to be one big, jumbled mess. And then sometimes, I run into something like this. What on earth is this character? It looks like an L with an equal sign through it. I checked the How to Programs guide. Nothing. I searched online. Still nothing. Fortunately, Compute's first book of Commodore 64 games included a reprint of Mystery Spell, and that solved the mystery. It's the pound key. Apparently, whatever printer Compute used for the original listings couldn't reproduce that symbol, so they improvised, typing an L and an equal sign in the same spot, kind of like what we used to do on manual typewriters. It's a clever workaround, and it definitely brought back memories of my grade 9 typing class, but man, what a delay. Now that I'm finished with this section, I'm going to run the code starting at line 1200 to see what the house looks like. Hopefully it's good. 
And it is. That looks great, actually. I'm now working through a long section of data statements. These define the sprite for the animated birds that appear in the game. Compute's programming assistant at the time, Eric Brandon, actually included a detailed explanation of how they work. There are six images in total, designed to give the illusion of flapping wings. Three of them show the bird's feet, and three hide them. On the Commodore 64, sprite pointers are typically stored at memory locations 2040 to 2047. By rapidly poking location 2040 with a pointer to each of these images in sequence, the bird appears to flap its wings. It's a clever bit of coding, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it looks in motion. As an aside, I used to love reading these kind of technical descriptions when I was typing programs in as a kid. Honestly, I credit them for teaching me how to program. And it's funny, the concepts I learned back then still apply now. Sure, the scale and speed are completely different, and we don't have to worry about running out of RAM or storage anymore, but the basic ideas, logic, structure, problem solving, are exactly the same. All right, I'm at the end of the code now, and here you can see all the words the game will use. The code for this part is actually pretty clever. It lets you enter as many words as you want. The computer just keeps reading them in until it hits an asterisk. This means it'd be super easy to create custom versions of the game with your own themes, regional spelling, or whatever you like. Okay, let's save it and see what we've got. This one's actually one of the biggest programs I've typed so far, 29 blocks, which works out to just over 7K. That's a pretty hefty program for something out of a magazine. And let's go. <laughs> oh no, I can already see a couple of typos in the instructions. And since this is a spelling game, we can't have that. I'm going to fix those right now. That's better. The instructions look good now. Time for the moment of truth. And syntax error in line 1330. Let's see what that's about. This one actually took me a while to find. We're missing the O in poke, but I missed it because of where the line wraps. I actually retyped the whole line before I finally spotted it. In addition to that fix, I did a code review and found a few other small errors, including a couple of typos on poke statements. They would have resulted in some interesting problems, I'm sure. But I took care of those, and I think we're ready to play. That's a nice looking house. Definitely more cheery than a hangman's noose. Hey, check out that bird. So cool. All right, I guess I should pick a letter. Let's go with S. I think the best strategy here is to start with the Wheel of Fortune letters. R, S, T, L, N, and E. And go from there. I love how the letter basically becomes a sprite as the bird carries it up to its spot. Eric Brandon actually explains how this works. The program grabs the character shape from memory location 53248 and puts it into the bird sprite. Really clever stuff. The article goes into more detail, but that's the gist of it. That's a neat little effect when the letter drops into place, too. All right, let's try for a T. Oh, and no. <laughs> I typed the word list in less than an hour ago, and for the life of me, I have no idea what it is. Oh, right. Okay, I remember now. It's laser. I've got to say, the animations are great, but it does take a while between letters. 
It'd be nice if there were a way to speed up the bird a little. And honestly, this game is just begging for some sound effects. I'm glad I started with a five letter word. Laser for the win. Now let's purposefully fail a word just to make sure that part works too. I've been deliberately picking all the most obscure letters I can think of, and sure enough, I only guessed one. Why did I even choose an A? You can make up to eight mistakes before the game ends. I think it's usually six in standard hangman. A head, a torso, two legs, and two arms. Well, cool, I lost. I think the game is working perfectly, though. This is a high quality title. I remember playing educational games at school and this feels like it would have been right at home on that C64 we had sitting at the back of our classroom. We actually had one when I was in sixth grade and I was one of the only kids who knew how to program. I can say with almost 100% certainty that if we'd had this game, I would have added my own list of words just to make my friends laugh. Might have ended up with a detention, but totally worth it. I'm also really impressed with the work that Eric Brandon did on the sprites, especially that little trick he used to animate the letters. In my opinion, the only things missing from this one are a bit of sound and maybe an option to speed up the birds. But other than that, this game fits perfectly with the kind of educational software you'd find on the Commodore 64 back in the day. Kudos to Doug Hateman for developing such a great title. And really, who doesn't love a good game of Hangman once in a while? Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribing. If you have any memories of typing in your own programs or about an epic game of Hangman you had, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Hope to see you again.